what astrology has to say on the past, present, and future of politics, and the surprising fact that it is a lot, especially this year, by Martin Resney. Full disclosure, I'm not really an astrologer. If you've read my articles on astrology, you'd know that I find astrology to be a fascinating thing to study, from the scientific point of view, but that's about it. I would say that there are interesting aspects to it that can be turned into practical applications, even if astrology as such is misguided, because I have already been able to do that. There's also no single astrology, but rather many different ones, and each has to be evaluated separately. Overall, I'm not claiming that it definitely works, that I know exactly how, or that you should ask me to write you a natal chart reading or anything like that. I mean, you can try, and I can try, for science, and I am doing it on occasion, which brings me to where we are now. Atypically, multiple people have asked me, independently of each other, several weeks ago for a prediction, an astrological outlook, if you will, because their lives are not going well, and haven't been for months prior, and so they're unsure how they should proceed. So, I have looked at the current planetary positions, and those projected for the remainder of the year, and how the things are supposed to proceed from there. And now I'm thinking that I need to share what I found, much like you would end a medical test as soon as it turns out that the dragon trial is a real cure. Or poison. You'll see what I mean. The specific type of astrology that I'm talking about is called mundane astrology. It's the one that falls most completely within my scientific area of expertise, as it is about planetary transits, planets moving into significant positions, predicting and explaining the future evolution of political events. To be clear, political science, the field in which I have a major, can't do any such predictions, so one might as well try to use astrology, or a crystal ball, to try to guess at what the future of politics will hold. There are simply too many factors that can potentially affect politics. Retroactive explanation of the meaning of political events is very much the name of the game here. What's important right now is that which planetary positions are significant and when they're going to happen is not open to interpretation. Planets physically exist in space, and their movements obey the laws of physics. The meaning of transits again falls into the political science territory of trying to make facts fit your ideology, I mean theory. However, astrology has a straightforward first reading of what signs and planets are supposed to mean. Each sign has a strong leaning toward a certain type of politics, and each planet is like a specific type of person. When a planet is in a sign, it's supposed to be that type of person having power over events, enacting the ideology of the sign through which it is moving at the time of the transit. Simple, right? To give you an idea of what that should look like in practice, take Pluto. Pluto, also known as Hades, is supposed to be the planet ruling politics as such, the use of power, especially the lethal kind. However, the best place to start is just the numbers, as those are entirely objective and not made up at all. It takes about one to three decades for Pluto to move through a sign. It was at its longest in the 19th century, indicating the slowest political change. And then it kept accelerating until the turn of the second millennium, indicating the fastest political change. <coughs> Internet. <coughs> the cycle of Pluto takes about 248 years, and the previous one ended during the period of 1797 till 1823 in the middle of which a little thing called the Napoleonic Wars happened, 1803 till 1815, ending a whole concept of politics called Ancien Regime, literally meaning old rule. Ask Wikipedia. The term Ancien Regime first appeared in print in English in 1794 and was originally pejorative in nature. Simon Schama has observed, virtually as soon as the term was coined, Old regime was automatically frayed with associations of both traditionalism and senescence. It conjured up a society so encrusted with anachronisms that only a shock of great violence could free the living organism within. Institutionally torpid, economically immobile, culturally atrophied, and socially stratified, this old regime was incapable of self-modernization. The cycle that we're in now will end in the year 2068, 
So I guess, regardless of any astrological interpretations, something of equal significance to Napoleonic Wars, if not their exact nature, is supposed to happen between 2044 and 2068. <coughs> Climate change. <coughs> During the current cycle so far, the transition years of Pluto changing from one sign to another were roughly 1822, 1852, 1883, 1914, 1938, 1957, 1972, 1984, 1995, and 2009. Yes, you're right, it does include the start of World War I and the start of World War II, and it frames the fall of the Soviet Union and the formation of post-communist states very well, as well as the previous financial crisis. Just like the years 1957 and 1972 mirror perfectly the phases of communism as they were taught to me in a political science course at the university. Apart from the sign transition, the other important time is culmination, the planet being in the middle of the sign. So far, the culmination years were 1837 through 1840, 1867 through 1870, 1898 through 1901, 1926 through 1928, 1948 through 1949, 1964 through 1965, 1977 through 1978, 1989, 2001 through 2002, and 2016 through 2017. Crazy, right? On the off chance that you're not a history buff, this includes the escalation of the Roaring Twenties, communist coups after World War II, pretty much the start of every major US war in the second half of the 20th century, actual midpoint of communist state revolutions, 9-11, Trump's election, oh, and uh, the year Star Wars came out. Remember, this represents a minority of years, about a fifth. What I'm driving at is that in this selection, there is no selectiveness. Years of Pluto transits and culminations were predictable ever since it was discovered in 1930, which is both early and late enough. Major events coincided with it before people knew about the planet, but also long afterward. I dare you to argue that these events, when taken together, do not cover almost all of the most globally important political moments of the last more than a century. Objectively speaking, there aren't many equally important events starting or ending during the Pluto off years, so to speak. Now, this may all be just a coincidence, and since we have no alternate planet with its alternate history to observe, this cannot be easily replicated. I'm not calling it science, exactly, but it sure looks like it's something. The thing is, I haven't even gotten yet to what astrology says the dominant ideology in any of these periods should be, based on the sign in which Pluto was located at any given time. If this is all just a coincidence, then prepare yourself to explain a whole other level of just a coincidence. Look into any best-selling astrological textbook, and you will have to surmise that Aries is about identity, so nation-building and emancipation, Taurus about land, or more broadly stuff, Gemini about communication and innovation, Cancer about family, so, you know, nationalism and racism, Leo about heroism, or just ego and violence, Virgo about work, Libra about peace, culture, diplomacy, etc., Scorpio about secrecy, immorality, especially regarding sex, fanaticism and extremes in general, Sagittarius about fun and travel, also economic boom, Capricorn all about career and money, clearly capitalism, Aquarius about science and equality, and Pisces about faith and magic. Now try to map this sequence on the transition years starting from 1822. Guess what? Just looking at the highlights, the two nationalistic world wars framed perfectly the period of Pluto in Cancer, the most nationalist and racist sign by far. The innovative turn of the 20th century belonged to Gemini. The current period all about money is in Capricorn, and the bust, and it was preceded by booming, careless 90s, in Sagittarius. Long story short, every period fits very well in order, with no logical stretches needed. It is textbook. Combined, what we have here is a mighty fine coincidence. The vast majority of most significant events, by expert consensus, fit both transition and culmination years of a newly discovered planet, and their most straightforward political interpretation matches 10 astrological signs in a sequence. The number of random Earths you'd need to have to produce such a result surely isn't trivial. And guess what? Pluto isn't the only planet that fits. The whole point of mundane astrology is supposed to be cross-referencing positions of planets 
and looking for moments when they interact with each other, either working together in conjunction or trigon, strengthening or supporting each other, or fighting each other in a square or opposition. This is still a bit simplified, but it isn't much more complicated than that. Which is why I personally don't understand why it is so hard to find good examples of mundane astrology-based predictions. Most of what you'll find is either utter drivel, not actually astrology, way too overcomplicated, like looking at obscure cycles between planets that take several centuries to resolve, or focusing too much on vague spiritual implications. Newsflash! The planets and signs are supposed to rule everything, including money or toilets. It isn't difficult to do, or in any way confusing, if you start from the beginning and avoid vague esoteric language. Think of the planets like this. Jupiter good, Saturn bad, Pluto ouch, Uranus chaos, Neptune giving up. This year, for example, the ouch and the bad join forces in the capitalist sign on the 12th through 13th of January, along with the Sun and Mercury, ego and thinking slash communication. Any intuitive idea you're having about what that means is probably accurate. Soon, around the 23rd of March, the ouch will join forces with Mars. You know, war, and then finally, the ouch and the good will join forces on April 5th, and then to a lesser degree on June 29th and November 12th. That is a lot of Pluto conjunctions for one year. Sun and Mercury go through all of the signs every year, so no biggie. But Pluto is anywhere only once every 248 years, Saturn only once every 29 years, and the last conjunction between Pluto and Saturn in anything was in Libra in 1982, which was 38 years ago. In Capricorn specifically, think several centuries. The importance of Capricorn here is that Saturn, the bad, is the ruler of Capricorn, turning it into mean bad. So, mean bad ouch in total. You know, like uh, Old Testament level fires, plagues, locust swarms, the works. Again, without going into any depth of astrological interpretation, astrology objectively predicted something epically unpleasant for the start of this year that will be sustained and reinforced throughout the year. The reason why I'm writing this now is that there is some further twist predicted for the 23rd of this month, since uh, Mars is after Pluto and Saturn the third least pleasant. The effect of that should last until about the end of March, when Mars joins forces with Saturn in the first degree of Aquarius, which should be the first sign of where everything is headed in the future, since Jupiter and Saturn will finally escape Capricorn around about this year's Christmas, after which Jupiter will stay in Aquarius for about a year, Saturn for something over two, and then Pluto will finally move on into Aquarius in 2023 through 2024, where it will stay until 2044 meaning that this year is very much supposed to be an end. Relax, not an end of the world, probably, but an end to a political way of thinking that has started in 2009 and culminated in 2016, which brings me to what the actual deep astrological interpretation is of the current events. Pluto in Capricorn, besides the simple understanding that money is power, is supposed to be about the narrative that hard work building up one's career and social status is supposed to pay off that life is a debt that's supposed to be paid off. It's a mentality that's literally opposed to focusing on family, a mentality of an old person looking down on young people, trying to teach them a lesson in personal responsibility. At its worst, Capricorn is all about greed and letting the poor people suffer and die as punishment for, quote, laziness. You are exactly supposed to expect that this would be a period during which the population gets older because everybody is so overworked they don't have time to raise family, or when most young people can't even afford it, probably because they have been settled with some kind of debt for daring to be alive. Or simply because the old people are hoarding all the money and real estate. You are exactly supposed to expect that world leaders during such a period will be the richest, most successful businessmen, or people who can project that image, who will try to manage countries like companies, looking to maximize their own profits, with bankers actually running everything in the shadows working to widen the wealth gap as much as possible. That is, until Saturn in Capricorn meets with Pluto in Capricorn. Pluto, as the Greek version of the devil, very much offers you a type of deal with the devil. You will be empowered to reveal the truth of your character, following the maxim that power reveals. No, not corrupts, that's what humans do to themselves. 
This means that this power will be your own undoing to the extent to which your use of it was fundamentally corrupt or otherwise wrong. Saturn is likely to bring that about because Saturn is all about limitation and obligation, especially the most powerful one in Capricorn, which is why this year it's not surprising at all that a series of seemingly random events has created a situation in which all the failings of capitalism as a ruling ideology are brought to the forefront. It turns out that greed is not good when it comes to getting prepared for and handling a global pandemic. Really not good. A combination of profiteering and keeping most people unable to afford healthcare, because they presumably don't deserve it, has so far led to a global shortage of respirators and face masks, not enough people being tested, insufficient numbers of hospital beds, and the list goes on. Even worse than that, the philosophy of Capricorn can't handle collective responsibility. Capricorn fundamentally believes that they are only responsible for their own well-being, not for anybody else's, and the worst version of Capricorn can't live without luxury, like having a skiing vacation in Italian Alps when it's already clear that the area is infected. It turns out that there are ways in which we are all in this together, all equal. Viruses can only be stopped collectively. Well, almost equal, given that COVID-19 hits old people the hardest, as well as the countries with the most greedy, collectively irresponsible governments and societies. From an astrological point of view, it behaves in a remarkably predictable way, as a perfectly ironic karmic punishment. That's not a given. The previous big viral pandemic, the Spanish flu, was in many ways exactly opposite. It happened at the opposite point of the Pluto cycle, in Cancer, which is all about young people raising a family and basically eugenic ideas that what defines a person are their genes, their birthright. During that time, the flu hit the young people, especially pregnant women, the hardest, while the stupid politics that let it spread were the racist nationalism of World War I. Coincidence? Sure, but at this point, it will have to wait in line. Pluto is the Grim Reaper, removing that which doesn't work anymore, so that something better has a room to grow. In the annoying modern corporate terms, it can be thought of as quality control, checking the quality of people and taking steps to improve them over time. Steps that are only as harsh as is necessary. The bad and the ouch only come when people try to resist learning a lesson. Of course, people always try to resist learning a lesson. We could have, in a very real sense, already started moving toward the philosophy of Aquarius. Not doing dumb things only to make a profit, but instead using our ingenuity to fix global problems for the betterment of all mankind. Aquarius is all about all of mankind, not pathetic wealth fantasies of individuals. It has its pitfalls too, of course. Collectivism can be pushed too far, destroying privacy, personal freedom and individuality. We will have to address that, but clearly the time for mankind uniting to save the planet is here. The global problems will only keep escalating until we realize this and start acting in accordance with it. The advent of Pluto in Aquarius is literally one American presidential term away. How catastrophic that will have to be is up to us. So this is how not esoteric and not vague is the most straightforward and literally textbook astrological explanation of recent, current and upcoming political events. Again, I'm not saying that this is exactly science, but it sure looks like it's something. Since I haven't seen any astrologer put this all together in a coherent article, I am doing it for anyone to consider or dismiss as they see fit. Let me know if you have any thoughts about any of this.